but eventually you start to resent that work um even if it pays well even if it feels safe even if it's quite stable maybe that's what calls us to entrepreneurship is that we will pursue purpose and meaning even if it is inconvenient or doesn't pay as well or feels riskier it's just what we are called to do and the trust that you need to have in yourself in the face of but there's all these doubts and often lots of people in your life don't quite see things the way you see them and you're like i know but i must in this podcast i'm going to be exploring what it takes to live a life full of adventure and freedom I'll be interviewing adventurers, explorers, and business owners who have set their life up to have an abundance of choice. And I'm also going to give you the high performance tips and tricks I teach my adventurepreneur clients to have the kind of life they want and be the type of person they wish they were. So if you're not already, subscribe to the show and settle in for another episode of The Freedom Project. As a business owner, you're constantly faced with the same conundrum. Pursue what's expedient or do what is meaningful. Especially when it comes to marketing, this dilemma is ever-present. Marketing has been typically viewed as unethical, immoral and exploitative. But I believe it's possible to bring your product or services to market ethically, morally and congruently. And one person that's helped me do that is Kath Rearhorn of Kind Copy. In this podcast, Kath and I discuss why doing what is right is also what's profitable, harnessing the creative act, how to do your marketing without selling your soul, trusting yourself in the face of self-doubt, and so, so much more. Now I bring you the wonderful Kath Rearhorn of Kind Copy. That that product you're developing and your your process of it, what's that felt like? What's the what's the, the kind of feeling tone of, of going after this new version? Anytime I have an idea that I'm really excited about, there is a particular energy about it. There is almost a texture to it. And the idea comes on very quickly and it arrives fully formed. So it's almost like it's a little gift. So it might wake me up. This particular one came when I was in the shower. But there there have been ideas that have turned up sort of wake up now and write this immediately. Grab like I've written whole sales pages in my phone, just in the notes section, just because the idea arrives and it's just here it is. You just it's almost like I'm downloading it. So the feeling of it is just complete excitement. And I feel like I'm trying to rein myself in as I'm becoming aware of it. So it's almost like there's these two parts of me where the, I've got this idea and I'm excited to run with it. But part of me is saying, hey, hang on now, slow down. Is this a shiny object? Is this just a distraction? Are you just getting overexcited? Are you underrested and, you know, wired on caffeine? Um, is this actually worth your attention? How many questions do you have around this process? So I try to sort of rein myself in, but it just won't have it. And then it demands to be made. I feel like it almost arrives like that. So I don't know if that's the same process that everybody goes through, but they all have the same sort of kind of urgent definitely exciting texture to them yeah there's there's so many points from that that i just love firstly that the idea of the texture it's like you can get your teeth into it Mm. there's something very substantial about a creative idea that really is meaningful and not just something that's expedient whereas you're talking just before we started recording about those um there's there's kind of things that your clients want you to create or the market that wants you to create that's not meaningful to you but it'd be highly expedient and it would be like okay well this will tick a box this will purely generate revenue but it's not that kind of meaningful thing. And then I, I don't know about you as well, but I found when I've done those meaningful tasks, they're like a, a hollow, insubstantial expression of what I'm actually doing as opposed to the things I absolutely love. It's like, right, I can get my teeth into this now. I can really kind of grasp hold of this. Sorry, I, I took you out. Just no, I completely agree that. with you. And I also feel like I would go even further and think, while sometimes it is expedient to do those things because the market demands it or because maybe you're you're new into entrepreneurship and it is a necessity that you have to do those things and you don't maybe you don't have that self-trust and you don't have that internal gauge for what you should be paying attention to yet I think it probably does take time to develop but eventually you start to resent that work um even if it pays well even if it feels safe even if it's quite stable 
maybe that's what calls us to entrepreneurship is that we will pursue purpose and meaning even if it is inconvenient or doesn't pay as well or feels riskier it's just what we are called to do and the trust that you need to have in yourself in the face of but there's all these doubts and often lots of people in your life don't quite see things the way you see them and you're like I know but I must and I'll when did you it. first listen to that voice when 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 did you not go okay I'm gonna turn that voice down and I'm gonna just do what is expedient and tick the boxes and kind of um take the kind of societally expected wins and when did you go okay I'm going after this voice of, of purpose and meaning I feel like I often, in my younger years, I sort of follow quite a traditional path. I, I've come to entrepreneurship quite late in life. Um, I was a, when I did my degree, I wanted to do forensics. Um, but it was 2002 and I live in West Wales. So as you can imagine, there probably was not that many forensics degrees around. So I thought I'd make my own. Um, and I took law and psychology at the same time, because that's what I thought would be the most logical combination of subjects to produce that result turns out that is not the best combination um and i got sort of two years into the three-year double degree and thought i don't really want to do this um i keep feeling the maths i can't do any of the counting anything that's presented in spreadsheet i feel allergic to and so i feel like i have to pursue some other some other route and what i should have done really if i'd been a normal person is just ask somebody hey i want this outcome what do you think i should do but that sense of I'm going to I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. I feel like I've always been there in some capacity, you know. But then as you get as you get older, I think you have more of those experiences where you have gone off on your own a little bit and you've taken a chance and it's worked out okay, even if it wasn't the outcome you expected, it ends up being the outcome you needed and you acquire skills and stuff that you think actually this is all shaping the direction I would like to go in. Like what? What kind of examples? Like so for example, that thing about the, the degree and also thinking about every job I've ever had. Like every time I've had a job, even like rubbish little jobs when you were sort of 16, you come out of it thinking, OK, well, I've learned that I don't like this part of it. Or the next time I get a job, I know that I don't want these kind of circumstances and I would prefer something like that. So you sort of go through this iteration through trial and error just by having sort of poor quality experiences that you know you don't want next time even if you don't know what you do want you know what you're trying to move away from and I think in the beginning that's all you get not this that's that's the shape of the start of lots yeah. of journeys yeah. right that's exactly it the not this. not this 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 hurts this is uncomfortable this this is a bit shitty mm -hmm. what's the commonality between that original Okay, so you, there's something that you're saying, this is purposeful, this is meaningful, this is the original direction. And now you're pursuing an element of the same thing. What's the thread that runs between those two points? That's a really good question. I think it's decency. Hmm. I think it's decency. The, the um, pursuit of how people are treated, perhaps. So um, in the beginning, I thought I wanted a process or a system. I was quite driven by justice, I think, then when I was younger. Now I think it's about just human to human decency, treating people right, speaking to people in an empowering way, um, helping people to make a change without creating shame. Um, so for what I do now, Kind Copy was born out of, so this is a marketing agency for people who don't know, um, when I first got into this industry, there was a lot of knife twisting. There was a lot of, you're not enough the way you are now. So change is an, an inevitability that you should embrace. And it seemed like lots of marketing was based in that pain and reveled in the pain. It's not even just they identified problems that existed. It was that they magnified and amplified problems that maybe didn't exist. And that was the bit that I had problems with. I've got no problem with holding a mirror up to this is the situation you're in. But magnifying it or exacerbating it or exaggerating it to make it worse than it really is, I think that's unethical. I think it's unkind. I think it's counterproductive. I think you get terrible clients like that. Um, and so from my perspective, it's indecent to treat people like that if you expect them to trust you, to guide them on the journey. And it's 
unreasonable to think that you can break someone psychologically and then have meaningful change that they feel empowered to execute. So from my perspective, I think probably it's decency that, that runs through it, but I've never actually thought about that before. That's a great question. It's really interesting that that is, um, to put quite an old fashioned word on it, but something that we have been exploring loads on this podcast recently is virtuous. It's, mm. and I don't mean that in a kind of like a wishy washy virtue signaling kind of um, performative way. I mean, it's truly doing what's right. And that is, again, that's it's not very something, it's not always expedient to do that. It doesn't always move you forward in, let's say, a corporate world as quickly as, as just chasing the, the pain points, for example, could do. I suppose my question there is like, why do you think that's more important to you? Or why do you think that resonates as opposed to making the quick buck or um, not necessarily the quick buck, but maybe doing kind of um, exploiting the opportunity for everything that it's got? I think ultimately people are inherently good. And I think you, you could, you could manipulate quite easily. And I think lots do, but long term i don't think there's many people if you had a single individual on their own and you said would you knowingly make someone feel bad to get an individual advantage i think in a crowd people could be moved to do that in an anonymous situation like marketing is you could be moved to do that but i think if you have individuals one on one i don't think there are many people who would take that advantage because I think people are inherently good I'm not saying nobody would but I think most people wouldn't so I think when you can tip the scales and most people are behaving in a way which is mostly ethical most of the time I think the tides can turn and positive change can happen without having to you know attach the electrodes to the nipples or twist the knife or make people feel worse because long-term it's not effective anyway. So if you, so when I was an online coach, when I was a PT, if you had people come to you who were in pain, it takes no skill to press on that pain. It takes absolutely no skill and a complete lack of humanity to get your thumb in the wound. It just feels like they've come to you. It's such an open heart thing to do. To, to ask another human being for help as an adult is such an open-hearted thing to do that if you can twist and manipulate and negatively exploit their feelings, it almost feels like you're the adult in that scenario and they're the child. So to take somebody who's open-heartedly saying, I've chosen you to help me, will you help? And make it worse before you make it better just feels like a completely unnecessary step they were already else asking you for help you don't need to make it worse they need to trust you as fast as they can so that you can help them to get the result and the best way to do that is to put them back into an adult state so that they can take ownership and responsibility and they can lean on you in a collaborative way rather than a i'm absolutely bollocks i need you to save me um clinging on like a drowning man sort of way no like that's not fun for them they won't get an optimal result from that and the coach will end up hating that business so if all you've got to do is sell somebody some supplements or something where they just take a fistful of pills every day maybe you're okay with that but for a meaningful coaching relationship it's got a it's got to have a foundation of trust i think any meaningful relationship has got to have a foundation of trust Yes, yeah, quite the ego trip, though, to be able to say, hey, you need me. <laughs> you, like, I'm the most important thing in your life. And without me, you're fucked. Like, that's a, um, if your primary driver is significant and you have nothing else going there, like, it's, it's kind of a, a reassuring thing to do. But talking about drivers and one of the things that we've chatted a little bit about is um, essentially being a nice person. Have you ever found that's a hindrance to marketing well? Have you ever found that it's, um, and, and given personal experience here, like one of the things that I'm very good at and one of the reasons I'm a good coach is by putting things into perspective um, and being able to say, hey, let's see things clearly. 
let's not kind of exaggerate what's happening here and let's kind of get find some stability is probably the way that I'm putting um, in there if you have found that to be a hindrance the ability to um or the desire to placate yeah potentially and, and I think I probably do leave some um certainly some sales on the table from a, from my own perspective there have often been people who have come to me for I want you to write for us I'm gonna get a credit card I'm going to put this on a credit card. And I'm like, please don't do that. I'm like, I don't want to be responsible for anybody's sleepless nights. That and, he, and I remember this, it happened more than once. And he was like, I'm cool with it. I said, well, speak to your wife. She's cool with it. I'm like, listen, I'm not really cool with this. I feel like that's going to create um, the, the sort of relationship that I'm uncomfortable with. You're welcome in when you're in a position to come in and this doesn't stress you out. But in the meantime, let me help you to get to that point with other things that don't cost as much. So I get the need to hand this off to us, but please don't do that yet, because if it's going to create any kind of tension, that damages our relationship, because you're then looking to me to fix a perceived problem that I could just save you from creating the problem in the first place. So it's happened in that situation. It's also happened in situations where um, people have asked us me once upon a time and now us as a team to write in a particular way to attract a particular sort of client. I mean, if we feel like we leave somebody in a worse place for reading what we write, we won't write it. So that's one of our absolute policies. Nothing leaves the copy cave if it doesn't improve someone when they've read it. So we should leave people better than we find them. And we should sell hope and power. So if we are not empowering and we're leaving people hopeless, that's absolutely the antithesis of what we're trying to achieve. Hmm. Really nice. Really nice. And that, that comes through in the work that you've done for me. Um, it's it's absolutely evident. Um, it, it'd it be very easy. And I've fallen into this trap as well. And it's kind of like, especially when I was a bit more scarcity minded and writing a lot more of my own copy to go, well, this is... Um, here's a pain point let's exaggerate it and let's as you said turn the knife and it's a it's kind of an easy ploy and it's, it's quite a um an obvious one a very kind of unnuanced way of approaching marketing but like i think you've really really dialed that in and from what i can see and everything that i've experienced from, from you you have that ability to empower and it's a, it's a very different style of, of writing copy very kind of as you said empowering Thank you, mate. That means a lot. I think when I was first in this game, you know, I don't think anybody was really taking that tack. Um, it was a lot of knife twisting, a lot of pain focus, especially in the fitness industry, um, where I spend most of my writing. And it seems to be a little bit more mainstream now. But at the time I was doing it, it was, to my knowledge, I don't think anybody else was writing it like we were writing it. And it seems to have grown in popularity, one, because it works like absolute gangbusters, and two, because nobody wants to be on the receiving end of being made to feel worse about themselves when they're already in a vulnerable position. I think that's the difference. It's a, it's a power dynamic. If you're writing for, say, I don't know, solar panels or something, there's you probably could go a little bit harder in terms of, you know, what happens if the, if the lights go out? What happens if, they put the, if the energy companies put the prices up this year? That's a different sort of fear than an open-hearted, please help me with my health. And you've you've taken them at a low ebb, you know? So I feel like it depends on how um, what their emotional state is when they want to buy. Some people will come to you, particularly Tom, and they're in a fantastic emotional state. They're in a really strong position in terms of their business, in their ambition in wanting adventure and all they want is maybe a tiny bit more juice out of the squeeze but lots of people come to a coach because they really feel like they've absolutely tried everything they can try and they've come up empty I remember hiring you once upon a time and I was in a a fairly high emotional state I've got this problem um, where I if I'm running in a wad and I come back and I snatch I hurt my shoulder and now I'm scared to max out. So that's a tiny little problem. That's a very contained problem. If I came to you and I was like, my life is in a toilet. I feel like I'm about to get a divorce. Everything is a disaster. I hate myself. You 
the the way you sell that person in has got to be respectful because they're fragile. I think that's it's mm. it's not a complicated thing to relate to another human. You do it easily in real life, wouldn't you? You know, you you wouldn't have to think twice yeah. about this person seems like they're at a little bit of a vulnerable moment. I'm gonna be a bit thoughtful about how I talk to them. And for some reason on the internet, as soon as it starts getting written down, everybody forgets that human to human conversation. There's an amazing disconnect that happens in so many people between their thought and actual conversational tone and then their written tone. Mm. How do you encourage people to write as they speak or write as they actually think? There's tactical stuff I could say here, like record your copy as a voice note. If you're writing in Google Docs, there's a voice transcribe option. That will be tactical. The strategic thing is for me, Imagine you were on the receiving end of this. Is this something that you would be able to hear? Or is the tone of this message making you defensive? And sometimes you can be a little bit pokey. But if you're in the first half, say, of a written piece of copy, somebody is not bought in enough to your message at that point to take telling. So if they've read past the halfway point, you can probably be a little bit more direct with them. But if it's in the opening few lines, I would say be mindful of how easy it is to simply scroll away and ignore this message because people have got a million things vying for their attention. And if you're the one voice on social media that constantly makes them feel less than or fearful or full of doubt, they will simply ignore it or unfollow. So your message won't get out there. Even if you've got good intentions of helping that person, they'll ignore you because you make them feel bad. What are the other foundations of successful marketing and successful copywriting that most people break? Like what's the equivalent of movement quality or calories? Um, I think the biggest thing that I see uh, is people thinking they have to do it a certain way. So they do. This is the way it's always been done. This is the structure we have to follow. This is the headline format we write. This is the template we use. We have to have a call to action in everything. Otherwise people will have literally no idea how to behave because they've all had a brain transplant i just don't think that that's true i think treat anything you write whether that's an ad or an email or a social media post anything script treat it like you're talking to one person who you know reasonably well and who is reasonably intelligent so the rule of thumb i use is treat it like a friend of a friend in a coffee shop so not somebody that you're mega familiar with and you'd probably overshare not your best friend but they've introduced you to another one of their friends in a public place. So you're probably going to rein in the the extreme language a tiny bit. You might rein in, you know, some of your more extreme opinions a tiny bit just because you're in a public forum. So, and, and I'm not saying don't be yourself. I'm just saying be conscious that everybody can see that. So don't say anything that you don't mean, even if it, if it is extreme and you do mean it, say it, but have, have a mind to saying what you actually want to say. And I think we consume so much content. It's easy to get caught up in so-and-so said it like this, or, you know, Jordan Peterson says it like that, or they think this. So I guess I should do that sort of thing as well. Not being able to listen to your own inner direction, your narrative is a massive mistake. So, Tune out the noise and listen to what you actually want to say. That's your gift to the market. Every single time you post, every time you write a story, anything, what is the gift you're trying to give your ideal client? Do you think there's, actually, instead of asking, do you think, I think something that we do initially is we mimic what resonates with us. And we almost... It's like a Venn diagram and there's a small portion that overlays and we go, okay, so Jordan Peterson, like I roughly, I agree with this way and there's something within that. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of, I don't know, read a bit of stoicism or someone else or Seth Godin as as marketing example. You go like, well, there's this. And like that resonates with me too. So do you reckon there's like a a necessary part of, of mimicking to begin with? And then how do we, if there is, like how do we shortcut that process of finding our own growth? How do we get there um, or finding our own voice? Sorry. Um, like what, what's the process there? That's a great question. I definitely think that mimicking is an important part. I think because you're, you're in the process of constantly assimilating and 
distributing opinion, right? So consume as much as you possibly can. Consume phenomenal quality resources. And then go and find a conflicting opinion because you can entertain a thought without accepting it as true. And there's nuance in the thoughts that you do accept as true. So if you particularly like Seth Godin or you particularly like Homozi or Jordan Peterson or whoever, there are two rules of thumb that I tend to use for this. Yes, and, which is I agree with this statement and I would go even further. Or yes, but. If you love the podcast and you want to take in all the information in an easier to digest format or you just prefer reading, then head to my website, tomfoxley.me and click on the blog link. Here you'll find these podcasts in an easy to digest format, as well as descriptions and links that I may suggest in the show. Once more, that's tomfoxley.me. So I do agree with this statement, but it comes with caveats. So it's true in these circumstances, but not in other circumstances. Or it might be true in for this person, but it wouldn't be true for those people. So find a nuance. By all means, absorb as much information as you can but then absorb conflicting sources and come to your own conclusion. Because there's probably grey areas where you live that you're perhaps not as extreme as Jordan Peterson or Homozi or whoever, that in that is the nuance. And I think a lot of it comes from, I've taken on what Ryan Holiday says about stoicism, and I've tried it. So actually go off and try stuff. Go and live a life that's worth talking about, and then come back and share your lessons. So go and do something worth reporting on. So if you think to yourself, I, you know, I followed this recommended stoic routine from Marcus Aurelius for the last 30 days, and these were the three lessons I learned, or, you know, these are my main takeaways. I would read that all day long because that's informed by somebody who's got authority, but it's also an assimilation of personal experience that can't be copied. Mm. Yeah, and I suppose the opposite to that that people clearly see is um or clearly kind of stands out as inauthentic is mm -hmm. when someone hasn't lived that experience they they kind of you can kind of tell when people are bullshitting their way through of oh, this is what i've read and this is the what the information says and even if you go back probably 50 no, 10 years i remember like seeing a lot of people market on facebook around like this is what the studies say around i don't know sleep and sleep hygiene and it's like no one cares um mm. but people care about personal experience right yeah 100 percent. i think like one of the hot takes i feel like i've got in terms of sleep research is all of it is retrospective and so it's largely useless so you can wear the, i bought all of them the whoops and the auras and the you know the garments and sleep trackers and all that stuff but for me i'm getting this data afterwards I'm doing as long as you're doing all of the things you can to make your sleep as good as possible. This data doesn't actually inform the quality of your experience. So, like, I know people love it, and I'm absolutely not shitting on trackers and stuff like that. But if that was your personal experience, that's what you would talk about, right? I actually hired a sleep coach. Um, one of the biggest sleep coach names in the industry. I was sleeping terribly. Recommended it. Sent me an aura ring. Sent me a like. All of this help I was getting with all this stuff. Turns out I had ADHD. So none of those things helped my personal experience because my, you know, I took um, magnesium, all sorts of stuff that I was recommended to do. Um, massive stimulant in my brain, that one. So that it just didn't vibe for me. And I wouldn't have known any of that if I hadn't actually tested it. Interesting. What are the tactical steps do you take on a regular basis that get you in the right place for performing at your best um the same stuff most people would do you know training eating sleeping as well as i can um, i've got an office to work in i consume lots of really good quality inputs uh, so i read good books i listen to good podcasts things like that um i would love to tell you that i make time i in my day, I give it white space. I do all of the things I know I'm supposed to do. But the truth is, I work obsessively pretty much around the clock. Whenever the mood strikes me to write, I will write wherever I am. I will stop whatever I'm doing. That is the most valuable, highest value task in my life. And so every single room has got a laptop or a computer in it in my house, my gym, 
my phones, they all sync up, no ideas are lost. Um, and so that's probably something that I do, which is fairly extreme that most people don't do or wouldn't need to do. Um, but I'm, you know, I don't do lots of the things that I'm supposed to do. I don't do the white space. I just work as much as I possibly can because I know that when the ideas do strike, they've got the potential to be a seven figure idea. So don't lose them. And I, and I also don't trust my memory at all. So, so it's really important to me that like, I've got a, a robust way to capture and not lose ideas because that's, we're in the business okay. of ideas. I want to come back to um, the kind of the creative process, but talk to me about the very tactical idea of um, not losing your, your ideas. Cause that's something I struggle with. I'm so big on this. Like this is the most important thing that I do on a daily basis. So we are in the business of generating ideas and I feel like I have got so many and that's the currency. Like the, the concept of what I do for a living is so crazy to me. Like I take ideas, I write them down into digital words. I sell them to people who I've literally never met in real life for digital money. And that feeds my entire family. That's such a crazy concept, isn't it? Like I was born in the eighties. So to me, like you make money by building things or like, you know, having a product and stuff. So the like, even just the idea of it is so cool. Um, I'm just like never not gassed about that. So the, for me, the creative process is split into a couple of stages. Number one, idea generation. Never short on them. Um, they just come nonstop and every idea seems to bring with it 10 friends. You know, when you read a good book, and it's like, oh, this has just made me want to read like another five books by this person, though. And it just seems like that list never gets any smaller. That's what ideas feel like to me. So the most important bit for me is to capture them. So I've got two phones. I've got a work phone. I've got a personal phone. Then one of those is with me all the time. I've got a computer in the bedroom, two in the office, two laptops, gym, they like we're not going to lose anything so i've got however you need to grab the idea even if it's just on paper grab it um so we waste nothing um if we were hunters for if we were, if we were idea hunters we literally eat the entire animal so we we take the idea from like snout nose to tail, tail. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah we put the whole thing and i feel like all we need to do is just take one sentence so that might be from a podcast or it might be from a book or from anywhere wherever the ideas come from there are three places ideas come from. They come from outside you. So external things like the news or podcasts or books you've read, stuff like that. It comes from inside you. So beliefs you hold, experiences you've had, dreams you've had, wherever. And then there's the third state, which is the merging of the two things. And I think this is what people don't do. So the external uh, I'm going to reiterate somebody else's idea is what I see most marketing being. But this sense of I'm going to take this thing I heard and I'm going to evaluate it and weigh in and add to it or truncate it or qualify it or, you know what I mean, make it my own. That third stage is the iteration stage and that's missing most of the time. So once we've captured the idea, which sometimes can just be a word, I've got a post-it on my computer right now that says professional tits just because I thought it was a really funny phrase. So it could be as little as that, or it could be a whole paragraph. That gets used and reused and returned to and discussed and iterated on. And sometimes it gets assigned to one of our clients. And I think to myself, that sounds like them, or that sounds like something they would say. And then it becomes theirs. But we can do that because ideas are so abundant. It's not scarce at all. Do you have a process of looking through your ideas or do you just throw them down wherever you can and then hope you see them again? I would love to tell you I've got a proper structure for this, but I really haven't really. I've got the notes section on my phone. I've got a post-it. I've got a notebook. I've got a journal. I've got a Trello board. I just grab them wherever. But because I'm using all of the tools all of the time, it almost doesn't matter where they get stored because I'm reviewing all of the resources all of the time. So I should probably have a better system, but it's such a massive volume of stuff. I don't even know how I would start organizing that. So I'm going to be content to let that be a little bit messy for a while. 
Yeah, so I was listening to this podcast between Rick Rubin and John Mayer. And John Mayer was talking about if you spent all day at the studio, but you get home and work all day in the studio working on one idea, and you get home and you can't remember it, it's not good enough and you need to start again. So like that idea of like it should stick in the mind, I think that really, really sounds about right. And there's and I'm I'm looking as well at the Creative Act by Rick Rubin. Have you read that book? No. Oh, I think you'd love it. It's what you're talking about here about creativity and the ideas that like seem to come to you and be possessed. Um, or they seem to appear from somewhere else other than you. Um, yes. It's a bit woo-woo. Um, it's a bit, um, I would say, spiritual in some aspect. But when you're looking at someone who has the back catalogue of, of music like Rick Rubin, um, I think you can probably go, I'll, t- I'll take that. Um, but it's fantastic talking about creativity. And it's almost like you're channeling an external force. And I think the metaphor that he uses is like, you are the distributor of that or you are the receiver of that. And it's like you sit there and you you wait for it to appear and then you are the person that channels it. And it's your individual and your um, unique experiences that channel that into the your version of art and it sounds like you're doing a very similar thing there. I've never read that book but that's exactly what it feels like so you know I said to you if I have these ideas they come fully formed it almost feels like they come to me this is going to sound I don't really talk about stuff like this as a rule but like it comes to me and I feel like I'm a conduit so it comes from some other place the the universe or god or a source or something and it comes to you. He calls it form. the source. Say that again. He calls it the source, like okay, capitalized okay. the source. Yeah. So, so this idea of maybe I maybe I have heard that idea somewhere else then, but like it almost feels like it comes from this external place. You are almost like a, I don't want to say like a prophet, but it almost feels like you're a conduit. The idea just passes through you. You have nothing really to do with it. You're there to transcribe it. I feel like I'm chipping it into stone. So whenever it strikes, whether that's, you know, you're doing something else or you're asleep, get up and record it because this is almost, it feels almost divine. Record the idea as accurately as you can and then get out of the way. So I can't tell you the number of times I've been woken up at three o'clock in the morning with a fully formed idea, sat down to write, launched it, profit within 24, 48 hours from nothing, from literally nothing on the page just because I felt like this is the thing that I am supposed to be doing. Um, and I've got full conviction in the idea's quality and its impact on other people's lives and its validity as a process. All you do is you start writing. And when I come around, it's almost like you go into this fugue state almost. You come around, five hours have passed, you've got no concept of time. And you think, oh my God, I've made... And you read it back over and it's banging. You never have to edit anything you write at three o'clock in the morning. That is fully formed. That's a gift from wherever it comes from. And if you get up, if you ignore that, if you refuse to get up, I feel like you're just spitting in God's face. Like you won't get any more ideas now. I almost feel like you have to, I feel compelled to record it because if you don't, you won't be given any more. Yeah. It's almost like you're myelinating a pathway to the divine. It's like each time you engage that, you you reinforce it, you make it more likely to occur again. And I remember messaging you at probably a similar time in the morning. I think it was about 3.34. Um, and my dog was literally throwing up blood in, next to me. And I was like, I've got it. <laughs> I've got it. And it was, it was there ready to go. It's something that I'd been forcing for so long consciously forcing and this relates back to something we were talking about earlier around like this idea of like logically it's almost like that logic wants to constrain the idea but the initial phase is like i'm just going to channel this for everything that's worth and maybe there's a logical stage later in the the editing process um but for now it's like just receive it and just put it down and don't judge it as you write which is kind of a a tough thing to do 100 percent. but it's a very expansive way to operate and i feel like as a business owner when I can spend as much time as possible in that expansive state, my team are there to ring me in, to make me be logical, to put me in a process, to try to make a system out of what I'm saying. But I'll be like, pen, pen, I got to write. And and it's coming now, it's happening now. So like having a way of recording it, I feel like that's my role. So nobody needs to have the vision for what this needs to feel like, but I do. 
everybody else can be as logical as they want and as systemized as they want and they can talk to me about socks and processes and all that shit but that's not my bag i'm here for the big thinking and i feel like that's when i'm allowed to do that that suits my personality really well um and it allows me to to serve our clients in, in the strongest possible way how long were you a solopreneur for and when you were how did you manage the different aspects of okay i've got the creative big thinking and then also i've got to um i don't know go through my my receipts and, and dial those in um so well, it's I not left, very well <laughs> yeah i just didn't do it to be fair i okay. left teaching let me think i was i think i left in around about 2000 and 18, I think at the start of 2018, I became a self-employed, fully self-employed with no other income. I started off on the gym floor and I and I didn't know that you were supposed to, this is going to sound so daft for your audience, but I actually didn't know that you were supposed to be recording your accounts. So I remember saying to my mother, we've made, you know, 20 quid today or something. Um, and she was like, so you better write that down. So I was like, what do you mean? She's like, you need to be recording your income. So I did that for one year. <laughs> and then the next year, she's like, you're supposed to record how much you spend as well, mind. It's like, okay, I didn't know that either. So I did that in year two. My growth was very small. It wasn't really enough money to get excited about or have to pay any tax on, really. So when I was on my own, which was from around about 2018 till around about, I guess, maybe 2021. So about two or three years, whatever that is. Um, I was just writing. I only paid attention to writing. I didn't spend any time doing my accounts, doing my, you know, writing the numbers in the spreadsheet. Spreadsheets are terrible. I feel like I just cannot get on with them at all. Um, stuff like, you know, should I build an email list or actually do some marketing of our own I was just like just write all the time study writing and write that's all I did for literally about 18 hours a day until I had my first team member because by then I was so overworked I said yes to everything I wanted to learn as much as I could and I was like shit I'm kind of like I had a seizure like um that year I realized that I was just mega overworked. Like I would say, I was just, I loved it so much. It's almost destructive. I don't know if any of your, um, if, you, if you've ever had this conversation with entrepreneurs before, but you love it so much. You're so obsessive about the work. You can't stop. It's almost like a grasping a thorn almost. You're just like, I, I, I want, I want to, it feels like play. And so it becomes almost a dopamine chase. And you're like, this is so fun. I'm, it's so creative. I'm enjoying it so much. But now it's 3 a.m. and I haven't slept for two days. And now I'm starting something else. And I should probably just, you know, chill out. But that's not an option. So I feel like there, there's a bit of a, a double edge to it where you're immersed and intoxicated by it. But you can't regulate yourself very well. Maybe that's just me. I'm talking about entirely about my own experience with that, but um, I feel like I'm. It's no, hard to to not, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the sign that you're into something that is aligned with your own genuine intellectual curiosity. When you, when it feels like play to you, <laughs> yeah, or, or maybe that too. Um, Naval Naval Ravikant always talks about that. The idea that like you want to find something that feels like play to you and looks like work to others. Mm. It sounds like you've got that. And that's all, all you're doing there is is channeling that and, and tapping into it. Um, how have you reined that in over the over the years to something, or have you reined it in? Um, and uh, actually, I'm going to come to the second question later because it's, it's going to take you on a tangent. I honestly don't know if I have reined it in, and I'm and I'm not sure I'm going to bother trying anymore. Um, had that seizure, um, unemployed people. Then <laughs> I was like, okay, I need to get some help. Okay, talk um, to me about the seizure and what happened there, because they can't I just leave that. My, like I used to have this years ago when I was uh, I was unemployed for like sixteen months, right? So I became a qualified teacher, lecturer, and then I spent sixteen months looking for work. And the signing on process was so destructive for me 
I felt it was so lacking of purpose, so directionless, so unstructured, so uncreative and so judgmental that I was deeply unhappy at that time. I was young. I was like in my early 20s um, and really genuinely wanted to to work. But I couldn't find a teaching job yet. And in that time frame, felt like I was so stressed out by the act of being unemployed and the, the judgment of taking before I put in almost, you know, that I had a, a period of time when I was having seizures then. Um, but then they went away. I hadn't like I got a job and I taught for 12 years and they went away. I had one total random one um, around about 2020, I think, 2019, 2020. Um, and I haven't had one since because I, I hired then and I was like, hey, I actually do need to get some help here. So um, that was a was the impetus for that, you know. But I feel like, have I regulated myself? Probably not that much. Um, I got a therapy. Uh, that's been a fantastic experience. I have, and I've got a lot more awareness of where my energy is high and low in my work. But I'm not sure I necessarily want to rein it in all that much because I love it. It's a, I, I'm guessing what you've done then is supported it in a way with the team. You've built up a foundation around it. Yeah, I put more coping mechanisms in place, um, regulated my, how much time I spend outside of my bubble. Like, so I have scheduled bubble days throughout the week, uh, which means no calls, no interaction, just writing, just in the zone. Writing. How many days a week is that? A minimum of two, normally um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, during which time phone gets a bubble day notification goes on it and don't listen to voice notes don't take any calls don't jump on zooms for any reason don't schedule meetings and i just stay in the zone and i love those days those are my favorite days very deep work vibes yeah very much a cal newport energy really nice really nice and then my other question i, th I suppose we've touched on this but we often talk about the the prizes of of kind of scaling but what are the prices that you've had to pay for for scaling the business? The price I pay, I think, I think the main price is that now my job is much less about writing, um, which is a shame because I love it so much and it's, I feel like I'm good at it and I and I want to do that. But you can hire writers, and I have hired writers. There's there's only one person in the business that can have the vision for the business, and that's got to be me. I can hire other people to do the other bits. In an ideal world, I would do the right thing and I would hire a CEO. I feel like I would love that job. Never have to take a call, never have to go to like any in-person events. That probably speaks to my personality quite well. Um, but the reality is I feel like I can think bigger. And I think that's probably where I'm needed most. What's exciting to you right now when you're looking at this the growth, your personal growth and what lies ahead for you? Like what, what excites you in terms of business? I think the, the most exciting thing is that we're going through a period of, of loads of change. The market is very dynamic and it's very strange. Um, so it's testing my ability to emotionally self-regulate, to show up and be a good leader, which I feel like has not been a skill I've ever developed. Um, and I think it excites me to think where we'll be in 12 months. I think the people who are really leaning into this period are such gritty, cool people that they're just good to know, you know? I feel like it's a... The other thing that excites me about this is that we've got the whole world of people that we can talk to. It's never not a cool thought that you can go online and talk about the most niche, tiny, almost minuscule detail, and somebody else will join in. And you can meet... Like, it's really democratised friendship. And I think doing business with people who are like that, I think people like us, Tom, like we don't really find a lot of people in real life that are like us. I think we always are aware that we're a little bit on the edge and a little bit different and a little bit disruptive to most, like we disrupt the norm for most people in our lives. And we're cool with that for the most part. But when you find people who are like you and the standard of conversation you can have and the standard of support you get for things that nobody even really un understands, accept you but they get that you get it and they get that you're enthusiastic about it and that's enough that is insanely cool to me 
that level of democratization and access to people who you'd never even know about otherwise, that's exciting. That's really cool. Talk to me about video and your journey into video this year. Oh God, I'm so bad at it. Um, So basically what I've learned from this, so I've now been doing it one month. And what I've learned is if you were having a conversation with somebody in real life, you would have all the skills you needed to be a reasonable human, right? So you could be, you'd modulate your tone, you'd, you'd regulate your eye contact to a degree, um, you'd know what's an off-topic discussion or what's like a off, like you'd feel their body language if they became uncomfortable. And in writing, that's always been dead easy for me. I'm like, I can make this translate into writing really easily. Not difficult at all. But when it comes to video, I'm so awkward and weird and uncomfortable and forgetful on camera that it's like I'm learning this whole thing again. So on the one hand, it's useful for me because I feel like when I help people with their copy, I'm like, you've already got this skill. This is exactly the same thing, but it's a good reminder that under different circumstances, you can't always access the same skills. And the other thing that I've really enjoyed about it is that there's there's been loads of positive comments of people who are supportive mm. people like to see you uncomfortable they like to see you being willing to look a little bit foolish or to think normally i'm really good at this thing but i'm not good at this thing and i know i'm not so i'm gonna have a go do you remember when you were in school and um like the teacher would call on somebody to read or to help them with something and you're like oh god oh god don't pick me don't pick me and then some absolute hero would emerge from the crowd and they'd be like i will help you and everybody in the room like i felt like you could feel the love and the admiration for the volunteer you'd be like thank god for you you are the sort of human i want to be you know the kind of person that volunteers for things is just like a huge admiration and that feeling of i'm <laughs> i'm foolish I've got zero skill. I'm going to do it anyway. It's a really good leveler. So that's been a valuable sort of psychological exchange for me. I've, I've quite enjoyed that sense of, I'll give it a go. What am I going to learn? And each week I've sort of written down a couple of things I've learned that week. And there's always been something. I've never had a week yet that I thought, didn't learn anything this week. So I, I also don't think I'm getting any better mine, but... That doesn't matter so much. I've noticed a huge difference in <laughs> in the quality and the uh, the skill set. Like it, it just seems like you are way more um, way more relaxed, and it seems like you're way more authentic. And you've kind of got past that barrier of um, I've got to be something different almost. And it seems like you're like okay, I'm me. And you've you've always been a very authentic person, but I've, I'm seeing that come through in what you're doing now. And it's it has been a, a a real um, significant shift in Thanks, in the, the way you come across. So you're doing exceptionally well. What I love about the last, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes of conversation is that you've spoken about this kind of, this process of I'm going to set my sights on this is what I want. And I'm where you've got to jump off the call very soon. Um, they, you've set your sights on this is exactly what I want. And then you're growing into that space um, and you're becoming a better version of you. I'm going to let you jump off and get around Thanks to that um to that call you got next um quickly where can people find you and and like and hopefully hi you i would love for people to come just to say hi to me come and talk to me on instagram sign into the dms my username is kind copy uk you won't get sold anything that you don't want you aren't going to be bought you're going to buy anything you don't ask for just come and chat to me i like cats i like music i like books i'm kind of a nerd and the more niche you can be the better come and tell me something you're enthusiastic about i would love that Awesome. Thank you so much.